sharing our stories connects us. Listen and be connected. Join us for the conversation meeting weekly at the intersection of community and culture. Hosted by Mario Nunez and Joe King Carter. There he is, there he is, there he is, Joe King Carter at the at the intersection of community and culture. Joey, get out of the intersection. I, I, but it's where all the fun is. That's true. That's very, very true. <laughs> I'm your host, Mario Nunez. Again, I just introduced Joe King Carter. You're listening to WMNF Radio 88.5 here in Tampa. You might also be listening WMNF.org from anywhere on the planet. You happen to be seated with a decent internet connection. Joey, here we are, man. It's Wednesday. It's hump day. And we love it when it's Wednesday and it's hump day because that means we get to come in here and share our views and our guests and our opinions with our listeners. And of course, tomorrow's a special day, as we all know. It is a day of giving thanks. Joey, what was your week like, uh, let's say, leading up to today? Well, you know, it was uh, a great week. I didn't have, uh, I can't really uh, speak to anything uh, that was uh, not uh, basically wonderful. Okay, so and, a remarkable week. Uh, we can leave it at that. Well, yeah, it was nice. I'm, you know, in, in, in light of all that has happened to us in the last uh, couple of months, uh, the weather has shifted a little bit. And I Boy, tried, we appreciate to, that. tried to keep uh, my mental clarity and uh, uh, completely clean of any kind of stress absolutely i wish i could say the same but we also have someone in the studio with us that uh well she's wearing her um chapeau today she looks lovely oh <clears> that's, <throat> that's right from us, that's jessica green jessica g the og of the board ops there you go how you doing and we're grateful to have her here hi jess how are you happy thanksgiving happy thanksgiving to you as that's well it. So jessica has promised us that from this day forth she will be uh ably assisting us by reading our emails because sometimes when we get carried away in conversation uh, and we take phone calls, it gets a little bit uh, difficult. So, Jess, you have carte blanche. Uh, just give me a hand signal over I can see you. If I sit up real tall, I can see you over the monitor, and, uh, and you can let us know when we get um, emails. All three of us could use a little height extension. I'm telling you, or at least a booster chair yeah. or something for crying <laughs> something. out loud. Yeah. So listen, today you're in for a special treat. We've got a, a Tampa native of note with us in studio. Uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about what he's done throughout his career. Maybe share a story or two about an early Thanksgiving memory that he might have. And uh, we're all connected, as we like to say on this show, if you've been here in Tampa for any length of time. And, Joey, you've been here for a hot minute now. Uh, a little while, about 50 years. That's yeah. pretty good. And you came up, you found your way up here from Bradentown. Is That's that right, yes, as a, as a young uh, uh, whippersnapper. A young whippersnapper, yeah. an inspiring artist, and bon vivant. Yeah, looking, absolutely, all that. Looking to have a good time in Ybor City, as it were. <laughs> you, you, didn't, you didn't end up in, I mean, you didn't start out in Ybor City, but you, I guess you found your way there. I'm laughing at the good time part, because sometimes it wasn't a good time. But, uh, yeah, you know, I discovered Tampa and... I grew up in the shadow of Tampa. You know, if you grow up in one of the communities around Hillsborough County, uh, Tampa is the Big Apple or the Big Guava. And so all of your, when I was a young lad, uh, all of your uh, uh, TV personalities and uh, uh, all, everybody, everything came out of Tampa. Sure, all the, all the events, the Harlem Globetrotters were here, the Ice Capades were here, the Gasparilla Parade. Everything, the State here. Fair. State Fair, thank All you that so. good stuff. Yeah, so me, I and my parents, you know, my parents and I would come up and, and uh, Tampa was always a special place. So the fact that I ended up getting uh, stuck here uh, was, it turned out to be a good thing. I think so too. And it's done well for your career as well. Yeah. So our guest today in studio is Mr. Tom Fillion. Tom, uh, as we have noted uh, earlier, is, a, is an artist, uh, is a poet, is an author, and somebody who has um, been well ensconced in the community for how long now, Tom? Say hello to our guest, first of all, and then tell us a little bit about your family history. And Tom, if I could get you to just move a little bit to your oh, left, okay, sorry, yeah. so that way I can keep an eye line on you. And, uh, and, and there we are. Hi, Tom. Uh, thanks for having me. Of uh, I've been in Tampa 70 years. I'm 72. I moved here when I was two years old. From? St. Johnsbury, Vermont. Oh, wow. I'm okay. from, originally from Vermont. Uh, Vermonters, your whole family? Uh, so my older brother, Danny, the, who you know, Danny was born here in Tampa. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, my dad is French-Canadian. He was born out, outside of Quebec City. I love my it. My mother uh, was from East Orange, uh, New Jersey. 
and they met in Vermont at uh, Linden State Teacher College. Sort of the midway point between the Quebecers and the and the New Jerseyites. So, so New my Jerseyites. mother got polio in the 1950s. That's why we moved to Tampa because she, weather f- that and Florida is flat. She could not walk. We lived on a hill. Uh, we lived on Maple Street in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. Mm-hmm. Why does that surprise no one? Maple Street in <laughs> Maple, Vermont. Yeah, right. Tw- uh, Twenty-five Maple Street. You know, <laughs> there you go. That's it's on my it's in my soul. So you had mentioned your your brother's Mark, which went to school with my older brother at Plant. You guys yes. were all three Plant guys. We all graduated from Plant. And Danny and Danny, whom I is my age, and we went to uh, we played at North Palomino baseball together. Yep, and and I did too. Also a Plant guy. We all we all played at North Palomino back in the it day. It was pretty spirited back then. I mean, North Palomino back then was a competitive. I mean, w- would we put it on the same level as West Tampa Little League? Maybe not because we didn't have the numbers, but it was every bit as competitive. So West Tampa and uh, Wellswood. Another. Uh, yeah, they all had great baseball teams. Some of the, uh, you know, just in Belmont Heights, same thing. Don't sleep on, and don't sleep on either Elks or. Um, <clears throat> so that's, and that's where I played, Elks Lily. Right, don't sleep on Elks. And the other one that was back there behind Britain Plaza. Uh, I'm trying but, to think now. Well, that would be Palmasia. Palmasia was behind Britain Plaza what, on the other side of Dale Mabry. Elks became forest. Uh, uh, became foremost, I believe. Ah, I'm trying to remember but now. See, uh, It'll for, come back to me. See, foremost, uh, the dairy, they had a place on Gandhi and mm-hmm. the baseball field. So I played with, um, when I first went down there, Mike Gosling. Fair Oaks. He just came Fair, Okay, Fair Oaks. It just oh, jumped oh, into my that's head. That's right, yeah. <clears throat> Forgive me for interrupting. Fair Oaks. So I played uh, on the Tigers with Mike Gossett, who was... Mike we know, Graham. We know very well the Graham family, yeah, the Graham Eddie legacy. Gra- Eddie Graham. Eddie and that's Eddie right. Graham, yeah. And uh, so there were some uh, really good players down there. Oh, my God. Well, and, and we know that uh, Hulk Hogan played down there as well. I believe he played at Inner Bay, perhaps. He was down because uh, Inner Bay was I what fed Robinson him. High School. Yeah, and, and see, I taught at Robinson for 20 years. Did you? I did, yes. What years? So I went there about 2000, and I retired in 2019. What was your discipline? What did you teach? Uh, I taught, uh, I did uh, in-school suspension. All right, ISS. <laughs> Let's ring a bell for Tommy teaching ISS. I don't know, did you have to teach anything there, Tom? Oh, it was the best class ever, man. Of course. <laughs> Sit down, be quiet. Yeah. No, I didn't even have Study to say all. that. You may approach the desk. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, That's so wonderful. I did, I, but I taught math. Uh, okay. I did not, t- I taught in the regular part of the school, not the I- IB. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I taught math. I taught uh, trig and uh, algebra two, geometry, all the all those classes. And I also. Still understand that math today because, you know, that was one thing that, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, high math, uh, I didn't see the merit in it, so I didn't embrace it as fully as I should have. I struggled with it. You know, I just yeah. didn't see the practical application. Well, I mean, tri- trig is, um, you know, very useful as far as finding distances and so forth, and it's used in a lot of. Uh, so maybe it would have helped me hit the curve, your brother's curveball better had I known had a better uh, fixation on, uh, on, on, on trigonometry. No, nope. and that's physics. Huh? <laughs> no, because no, your brother was twelve to six. Listen, no. I digress. We're getting way down into the weeds on baseball. But, uh, Let's back up again and talk. But I also co- I coached um, when I first went there. I coached, helped with the track team, and I helped with. Or, and then I I was with. Um, I did the uh, boys um, boys tennis and uh, uh, golf. I did, did you bo- Did you enjoy your time there? Uh, I did. Yeah, especially you know what. This time of year for teachers, Thanksgiving to Christmas, best time of the year. Cause the the two-week break is coming uh, up. Well, and you, everybody's in a good mood. Yeah, you're off this week, and you're not, you know, you have time to do stuff. So that, to me, as hard as teaching is, uh, that this time of year was is really a good time. It you is. Know? And, so. Joe, we can all agree, I think the three of us here, close in age, all of us, that back then Temple was different. No doubt. Uh, Tampa moved a lot slower. I think the community was more compressed, and we all knew each other. Um, it's a big little city back. It was. And, big and little city. We still boast about that today, it's, and it's a warm and friendly place, too. Maybe sure. less so today because, you know, <clears throat> we're being the, the original settlers, as it were. The third and fourth generation Tampeños are being displaced. Right. But we still try desperately to, to, to retain that 
that warmth, that sense of community, and, and I think people leave us whenever they come to visit us going, wow, that's a, that's a nice town. And then they come back and they stay. Tommy, help me out here. <laughs> yeah. Get them off yeah. of 275. Well, I couldn't get here today. You know, I will tell well, you I this. I came down Buffalo. To, or, uh, no, 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 no. You came down Buffalo. You came yeah, down Buffalo. That's right. uh, you old timer, you. I know. Yeah. Well, and I, I told you I, I lived over in Seminole Heights at one time. And sure. I lived on Central Avenue. I lived in Sulphur Springs. Uh, when I was going to USF, I lived out on Fowler in an old Florida house with no AC. But Mercy. We had an attic fan. Yes, didn't we all have oh, those back in the we day? Had an attic fan. Very effective, too. Oh, yeah. well, you open all the fans. windows, and then you knew exactly where to stand where that air came up and out. Well, you, so, and, to get that uh, air conditioning. And I'll never forget, you know how much I paid a month? To, to, there was like $45. Four, that's a little too high. Okay. 30, oh, why? 30, 30, 30, 30, I think I paid $36 a month to live that on the back. That is impressive. I lived on the back porch. What has oh, happened to our wow. dollar? We don't even have a clue. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I just want to say very quickly, because you happened to mention earlier that I came up from Bradenton. My sense of it is, as kind of an insider-outsider relationship, is that the sense of community W- 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 really sort of hit me mm-hmm. when I came to Tampa that it was much stronger than in my in, than in my hometown. Now my hometown was much smaller, and you would think that the sense the smaller of smaller would be Mayor Barry RFD more or less. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you would think that that would therefore mean that there would be a stronger sense of community in that smaller town. Uh-huh. But it wasn't like that, and I think part of it is that. Tampa created an energy that sprung out of the immigrants that came here because what, as as a person who uh, teaches history at times and I conduct history tours, I'm a fan of history, the American story is the story of immigration. That is the American story. You're here. And the, you know, Tampa had all of these uh, Sicilians and Cubanos and Spaniards well, so and all of those... Germans. All of those Jewish. people... Uh, all of those groups tend to, without me stating any kind of prejudice, I think we could support this. They're very, very um, family uh, oriented and community oriented. It's very strong. My uh, Bradenton, w- where I grew up, was well, basically essentially a, a white Anglo Southern community. It was just like another, another uh, Southern town, another Florida. Yeah, Tampa has this energy about it that has that has uh, gone on from from uh, family to to their grandchildren to their great grandchildren and i think it's a different energy and it's very strong so let's ask tom so, because i'm curious to find out tom please so uh, my father is a naturalized citizen he was born in quebec so he had to be naturalized uh he served in the uh, navy during world war 2 and he's he's buried up at bushnell uh, the uh, the, uh, sure, the National Cemetery. National Cemetery. Yeah. And by the way, while we're while we're getting there, before because further down we won't be here. Do you have dual that, citizenship? Is, is that what you were going to ask? No, I was going to. I, I was going <laughs> to say that when Are I first saw your name, mm-hmm. I said to myself, "That is a very French name." Filion. Yeah. Filion. Yeah. So. Do you do you know much about your ancestry in terms of uh, great question the the home country? Uh, so I've been to uh, I've been to Montreal. In fact, uh, we went to the Olympics. My brother seventy six seventy six. We went to the Olympics. Bruce Jenner when he was Bruce Jenner <laughs> well, won the decathlon. <laughs> and won the decathlon. Sorry, uh, sorry. So we tried to go see uh, Sugar Ray, but we couldn't afford to that's get right, in. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But we went with uh, Mark and I, my older brother Mark. We went with Bill Burkus, who played at Robinson. Absolutely. And then he um, he was Bill was drafted by the San Diego. He's a big Padre. fella. Oh yeah, he yeah. was great. He was. A, uh, um, but uh, he went to the University of Richmond on a football scholarship, hurt his knee, and he came back here. He played for Robin Roberts out at USF. So. Uh, we uh, we drove Bill. He got a new car or something, and we we drove up to um, Montreal in his new car from here, <laughs> from Tampa. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's well, a couple of days. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so when I was sixteen, uh, my brother Mark and I we used to ride the Greyhound bus up to New Hampshire. We worked in New Hampshire at Mount Washington. College. Like during the summers. For the summers, sure, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, we went up there for the summers, and uh, we worked on the uh, the Cog Railroad because uh, my grandfather had worked. F- uh, my f- uh, French grandfather had worked for the Boston and Maine, and then he worked at the Cog Railroad, and 
So that's how we ended up there uh, from like 16. I worked there from like 16 to 20 what a during the summer. What a fabulous uh, legacy for your family. And I'm thinking that, as, as you alluded to, Joe, that Tampa has that draw, right? Tampa has that pull, mm -hmm. even, you know, for people that move away. Mm -hmm. I, I moved away for 15 years while I was chasing my career, but ultimately came back. Uh -huh. the, the draw is strong to come back. And you had the experience of going up north in your summers and, yeah. and experiencing the lifestyle, different lifestyle completely. But yet you still always came back. Yeah. Something special. Of course, I was still in high school at that point. By 16. Too, but uh, uh, but it, you're here it, now. I am, yeah. yeah. So, so did your family have a, do you know of a long history in, in Quebec? Quebec? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. They had farms up in uh, uh, St. Sylvester. Uh, and so the, Agra, Agra. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my grandfather, they would come, I mean, back in the day then, I mean, this is probably the 20s. I mean, you could cross the border, no problem, and stay. And so they s eventually stayed. And my grandfather, wor he worked at the Cog Railroad. That's how I ended up there. So I was the third generation uh, of my family to work at uh, Mount Washington. And what would you do? What were your responsibilities? So the first summer there, I washed dishes in the, in the restaurant. Nice. <laughs> what else is a 16-year-old going to do? The next year, I Peel worked... Peel potatoes. <laughs> uh, the next year, I worked outside on what is the called the uh, base crew. And we did... We picked up... Uh, we had a, this big thing that was called the honey bucket. We would go around and pick up all the trash and stuff. And uh, then by the third summer, I worked... Um, I was a switchman uh, on the trains because... Um, a little more responsibility now. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, and uh, I did that and I was a brakeman. So, uh, coming down the mountain, there, I mean, you have to pull the, the pa passenger car off the engine. Uh, so, that's what the brakeman would do. So, I did that. And then my f the fourth summer I was there... Uh, I was a fireman on one of the trains, and uh, so basically we, you know, you had to shovel like, it was like a ton of coal to get up the mountain. So wow. I'm thinking, and, and Joey, here, follow me on this. Mm -hmm. It was such an exciting time and, and such a, a variety of different skill sets that you were learning, a hard work certainly, and you loved it so much that you didn't do that as a career. I'm just, I'm just asking. It was you, you had enough of it that you knew I don't want to be a railroad guy my whole life. No, but you know what? What I'm, a great I'm, experience, I'm, though. It was, and I'm still friends with some of those same guys that I worked. That did with. stay. Yeah. Well, they didn't. So a lot of the guys that I worked with. Uh, they were they were going to like Harvard and Dartmouth. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. It was a real. Uh, it was a very interesting experience. For Smart a, guys. For a, yes, for a high school guy. I mean, there were some. There were older, uh, you know, local people sure. that worked there. Sure. Uh, that that. Uh, but these were mostly college guys, and I was just a high school punk basically, and uh, so it was. I worked with. Uh, do you remember? Um, uh, C. Everett Coop, the yes, Surgeon general. Yes, of course, general. Surgeon General, with that funny beard. Oh yeah, yeah. So his <laughs> his his son and daughter both worked there with us. Oh wow. Oh uh, yeah, it was it was a very um, interesting place, and um, you wouldn't we, trade that experience, would you? Not at all. There you it's go. Totally. And you went with your brother. You said Mark went with you. Mark went with me, and we had another friend. You skip from, Danny though. Danny was too. He was too for much Danny further down. Danny was playing the baseball. Right. 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 <laughs> And uh, he never did that. He's, I think he sort, sort of regrets it. But uh, Yeah, because you can talk about it now. I mean, you can share, you know, those stories. So one <clears> interesting <throat> thing on the, um, so when I went up there at 16, mm -hmm. we, uh, we stopped in Washington, D.C. And if, if you recall, on June 8th, Robert Kennedy had been assassinated Correct. in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So we got into on the Greyhound bus. We got into D.C. about five or six in the morning of June 9th. and uh, I had an uncle, Uncle Tom, by the way. There you go. My my brother. For whom my, you were named, probably, maybe. Uh, well, that and my grandfather was Thomas Allen Filion. There you go. So uh, I got there, and um, Uncle Tom, he took us to Arlington to the tomb of the unknown soldier, which is up on a hill. And uh, it was early in the morning, and if you look right down there, so Robert Kennedy, I don't know if you remember, 
They had brought him down from New York on a train late at night. So when we got there early the next morning, he had just been buried a few hours before we got there. And he was buried right next to uh, John Kennedy. Wow. Do they both have an eternal flame or just uh, John? I, as I recall, they, I think they both do. I could be wrong. Yeah. But the thing that got me was we were basically the only ones there looking down. They, The city had not cleaned from all the... They had not cleaned the litter. There was just litter all over the place. Oh, wow. And mm. it was just yeah. us looking down at... Did you did you absorb that moment? Did you know when you were... Gonna, did you look at your brother and say, do you realize what's going on here? Well, I'm thinking about it now, and I have tears in my yeah. eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that, Opportunities that, lost. We, we, we've we been yeah. struggling, Tom, for the last three weeks uh, uh, with our shows and our topics. Well, And so, once again, what a unique experience to have done that. Mm -hmm. oh, incredible. Yeah. And... and and unfortunately, like today, we all have phones in our pockets that have cameras. You probably didn't have a camera then, so the only thing was no. your mind's eye to remember it in the memory. So, and then here's the other thing, just uh, coming back. So that was 68 and 69. Um, I was coming back to Tampa and uh, uh, it was towards the end of the summer. And this guy that I work with, I'll never forget his, his name, John Montgomery, had just bright red hair. And he worked on the uh, counter in the restaurant, and um, um, it's towards the end of the summer. And you know, I'd been up there since early June, and so I was ready to come back to Florida mm -hmm. and go back to school, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I had already bought my ticket to come back to Tampa. And uh, John, he was, you know, he was kind of out there, kind of a hippie guy. And uh, hey, I'm going to this concert. It's over in New York. Uh, you want to go with me? And I said, damn, John, I, I bought my ticket to come back to Tampa. Don't tell me that was Woodstock. <laughs> it was oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, gosh. That's so, a double bell ringer so, there. Yeah, I know. I almost, I almost said a word I shouldn't have said. Yeah, it's okay. That's what Jessica's there for. She'll dump it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got back to Tampa and I'm looking at the news, you know, I'm seeing, you know, this concert, there's rain and all sorts of stuff. And I said... That's the concert that Montgomery wanted me to go <sighs> to. Well, I never saw him again. He never came back t to New Hampshire. So I don't know if he made it or not. I hope he did. Yeah. <laughs> but but that, that would have been a, a, another life-changing experience. And certainly it sounds like you've had a few of them in your, in your life. And, and it's been a good life. And, and I'm guessing that, you know, the history coming from... Canada and and from Jersey and we didn't talk about your mom's side of the family but give us a little thumbnail on your mom's side. Okay, so my um, my mother, um, her father was uh, John Farson Strang and he was a graduate of Cornell, and uh, so there's a he's in 1906 there was a fire at the fraternity house that he lived in. And it's a famous Cornell story. He was a freshman, and he was on the top floor of this uh, fraternity house, and they never figured out how the fire started, uh, but there was like six, eight people that were killed. Oh, students. So, uh, and a couple firefighters, uh, and uh, he, um, but he's, he was able to survive it, and you know, I, I, I was th thinking if he hadn't, I wouldn't be here. I we all have stories like that, I right? Know. Yeah, yeah. So, I realize the patriarch or the okay, matriarch. Okay, so his mother, mm -hmm. uh, and I have his mother um, went to Lincoln's second inauguration because her father was a congressman from. Um, from New Jersey, uh, John Farson Starr. So that would be <coughs> my great great grandfather. He was a congressman from um, uh, New Jersey. On your mother's side. On my mother's side. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. Well, you know we <clears throat> we uh, uh, Doris Kern. And I, I have I have a co I have a copy of the uh, invitation also. No, you don't. I mean, it's did you just, bring it with you today? Uh, 
No, I'm teasing, Tom. Stop looking. No, Stop looking. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Listen, I have a picture. We are hundred percent tease here because we can, but we know absolutely I'm, you're telling I'm, us the I'm truth. Just, it's just so I'm. I'm proud of that. Uh, well, why wouldn't you be? Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. I mean, not every family can boast that. No. You know, that's a big deal. And again, whether it was Abraham Lincoln or JFK or RFK and, and MLK as well, sure. you know, these have been monumental and altering situations in, our, in, in the trajectory of the history of this country no doubt. that I think we're still in some ways reeling from now. Let's do a station identification. When we come back, we'll give away the phone number and the email address so people can reach us here if they have any questions for you. This is Justin Peters, and you're listening to The Conversation with Mario Nunez and Joe King Carter on WMNF 88.5 Tampa. Listening to WMNF, as Justin just told us, and oh, let's give the phone number now, Joey. I'm going to do that because I'm closer to it and I can see it a little bit better. It's 813-239-9663 if you'd like to get in on The Conversation. Have a question for Tom, our guest, Tom Fillion, our guest today. Eight one three four three three zero eight eight five. If you'd like to send us a text, Jessica's standing by, waiting for your emails. You can reach us here at dj at wmnf dot org. Tom, that's fascinating. Um, and I, you know, listen, I've, I've known. Also, I spent a year in Saudi Arabia. Come on now, we're yes. getting all we're getting all the good <laughs> stuff. Well, how old were you when you did that? So I went there. I was in uh, Desert Storm, 91. I went there. I was there for a year. Were you covering it uh, correspondence No, I was, I How was, did you find your way there? Uh, so I was, um, I, I taught English to the Royal Saudi Air Force. I was teaching English. Tom, I, is there I, anything you haven't done? Let's just, let's flip all the cards <laughs> and just ask, were you in on the building of, say, I don't know, Tampa Stadium? Mm. I mean... No, but I know Henry Saavedra. I went to... There you go, the Saavedra family, of course. Saavedra. We know the Saavedra family. So he, how went did, to, he went to uh, St. Lawrence, Henry. How did you come to be teaching in Saudi the royal family? Yeah. Okay, that so really uh, I started down the street at uh, Hillsborough County Adult High School. They okay. had a huge program uh, for... E they called it ESL back in the day, uh, English as Second Language. I was certified in, in my degrees in English, but I went back and I I was I took a lot of math classes, so that's how I ended up teaching math, teaching math also. But I taught English to people from all over the world, wherever there were trouble spots in the U.S. or I mean in the world, they would end up at uh, down at Hillsborough County Adult High School, where that Winn Dixie is. Yes, remember yes, that yes. old building? Of course, of yeah, course. Yeah. So I taught there with, and all the teachers were out of Ybor City. Uh, they were just old Tampa guys, really. And uh, so I ended up there. And then um, I had a full-time temporary position that uh, in, in 1990, uh, the teacher, she was out on a uh, medical leave. She came back, so I lost that position. There, there was a hiring freeze, so I just applied for a job and uh, out of the Tampa Tribune. Oh, my. I know. And the next thing I know, and, well. It, when they had one at. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I had a, the uh, principal at, um, at Hillsborough County Adult High School, Isidore Landetta. I don't know if you know Landetta. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, so, I mean, he wrote me just a, a, a really nice letter and for my resume, et cetera. And next thing I know, I'm heading to Saudi Arabia. And I got there. Mercy. And, and I mean, we taught. Were you flying solo at the time, Tom? Did you have a I was family married. in tow? No, no, I was married, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And How'd she feel about that? Uh, the I, missus. Well, I said, hey, I got a job, man. Is I she just, listening now? My wife passed away. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I said, oh, I got a, I, I got a, I got a job, full time job. It's got all the benefits. Honey, we're going to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> no, the only thing is a long commute, baby. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> know uh, she would not go. Oh. And my daughter was eight years old, so that was that was very difficult. But in the summer, so this was ninety one. Uh, in the summer, they met me in Frankfurt, and uh, we drove from Frankfurt up to. Uh, J June, my wife was from New York City, and her family was Norwegian, and uh, so she, her dad grew up in Norway. So we s went up to Norway, took the, from uh, Den tip of Denmark, we went across to Norway, and uh, 
met up with some of her relatives and uh, uh, so two questions can yes, you identify those flags if they put them in front of you i bet you can and the other thing is isn't travel cool isn't travel because you've been traveling man you've been nomadic since you were 16 years of age that's true you yes. can't let no grass grow underneath your feet so uh i i would say especially um living a year in saudi arabia was transformative to me uh to live outside of the united states uh to see how other countries uh were conducted their business uh yeah. and at the time in 91 i mean we were pretty much welcomed by most Saudis uh, at that time because, if you remember, Saddam had taken over Kuwait, mm -hmm. and uh, we all remember the visuals, man, uh, the fires and uh, it's, horrible. And um, <clears throat> the the Saudis, they, I mean, they could not have stopped Saddam. He, he's if he had come down from Kuwait City t to. Uh, down that part of uh, the Persian Gulf, he could have taken the, over their oil f oil fields very right. easily. So th they were very appreciative, and uh, they could not defend themselves. That's a huge country. It's as big, Saudi Arabia is as big as the eastern side of the, U the United States from the Mississippi <clears> over. <throat> and there's, uh, you know, maybe at the time, maybe 15 million people. Uh, and so, um, it's a lot so, of open land. Uh, and there's Bedouins uh, all over the place. I lived on a, a U.S. Air Force compound, uh, and I was about maybe 50 clicks from uh, Mecca. But as a non-Muslim, I could not go to Mecca. Uh, you have to be Muslim, and you know you. you With care. identification cards uh, and everything, you, oh, of course, every, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere you went, you had to present that card. So. so Joey, you, we mentioned earlier because you did some a, a, a little deeper dive. And listen, let me say right up, to, up front, if you're just tuning in right now, and maybe you've just found us here, WMNF 88.5, you're listening to Tom Fillion, our guest today. This is the conversation with Mario Nunez and Joe King Carter, and we're learning some real fascinating details about Tom's life um, as it is. And Joe, you, you mentioned that you did a little deep dive researching some of the writings that Tom did. Let's, let's take the conversation now into how he became... A writer. When did he? Yeah. Well, let's when did he let's let to, Tom describe that because yes, I'm. Uh, we want to make sure, what I'm realizing right now is that is, an hour is not going to be enough. For yeah, this we could we could talk. This to is a Tom. four part show, Tom. Yeah, <laughs> this is a four part. Yeah, so we can talk to Tom back. for the entire show and not even get to his authorship. Correct. Yeah. So let's let's get to that because you are a poet and uh, you are and a novelist. Author. And let's talk about how that sort of evolved. So uh, f when I so when I, I graduated from. Uh, USF in 75, and then I went to work at, um, and, and I lived over on Central Avenue. I went to work at HCC, and the late, I, I, I did silkscreen printing, and uh, just, I was a gopher, basically. And, and, but the lady I worked for there, her husband had a, uh, he sold waterbeds at Northgate Plaza. So, <laughs> I very started, popular back in the day. <laughs> I know, man. So, um, I started setting up waterbeds for him, and you know it was all the underground economy. I mean, I got you know he just paid me per setup, but um, so I mean I'd set up waterbeds all over the place, all over Hillsborough County, Tampa, and it was a trip. And I used to tell him, I had a good friend, that, you know, he went to graduate school, and I said, you know what, setting up waterbeds—that's my graduate school. Yeah, <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, because and. and so that that's the f first novel that I wrote. It's very episodic, but it's really f some funny stuff. I met just some wild ass, some wild people. Absolutely. Well, it was a wild time. It was. It was. Yeah. A, it was a. You know, we were still like stretching I, those muscles, as it were. Yeah. So I got liquored and stoned with a lot of people. <laughs> I bet you did. Well, um, if you're going into a house to to set up a waterbed, you for, know right away your clientele. And you're there for like two or three hours. Correct. So, so you, you know, I just so the bongs on the table. Here's the you know some wine. We're we're listening all to but, Zep on the all different kinds of people. And that sure. was the, that was the thing. I mean, it was um, when I wrote the Dream Mechanic. Uh, it, it it just crossed so many social levels, mm -hmm. which is what I and I and I had. I had a, just a lot of fun writing it. But what was the impetus? 
for you, because for everybody who I write, uh-huh. and uh, when I was, oh, 25 years old, I had a little minor dream of being a writer of some kind, and I was actually aware of the fact that I had not had enough experience in life to have anything really to write about. So, so my point is, there comes a moment where you say, hey, I've got, a, I've got this stuff that I can now talk about, communicate, write. What, what was the moment where you said, I think I'm going to write a book about this? So what really, the year that I spent in Saudi Arabia, I wrote every day. There's nothing. Uh, nothing else to do, buddy. There was nothing. To nothing do, else to do except drink Saudi moonshine. Yeah, and and and, and pick sand out of your hair and, and, and out of your teeth. And, so I mean, if you're going to be a writer, you have to just do it every day. Yeah, right. And right. just be very. I'm very disciplined. Uh, I, I, you know, working and, with your Corona, your. What were you? What were you banging out there? Because uh, were we into word processors, or you have laptops already? What uh, were years were these, by the way? No, these are the nineties, right? Oh uh, yeah. So I had a, um, I had a K Pro. <laughs> okay. Remember the K Pro? Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> wow. Uh, in fact, I got that K Pro from pawn shop over on Dale Mabry, across <laughs> from uh, that McDonald's. You know that. Uh, uh, on the corner of El Prado and. Um, uh, Buddy, you're a South Tampa guy. Oh yeah. Raised and and, yeah, and still and yeah, no, on Avery Street corner, no, on Avery Street corner. So it was an old K Pro, and then at that point, um, well, anyway, that I mean, was your first, but that was your first effort. That was the first. The Dream Mechanic was your first book. Uh, yes, still yeah. available so, in print. So uh, can yeah. people still find it? Oh, yeah, it's all, all my stuff's available on. Um, for uh, those of you uh, in the listening audience, Tom is now showing us his books. Yes, because he, physically, he physically, physically brought, brought, brought them, them in. Them. Absolutely. Yeah. They're, but, I'm donating them. To you. Go. Oh, We're well, going to read them before we donate them on. But, but let me so let me just curl back a little bit more into Everything's this. Everything's available on Amazon, on, okay. or on, uh, in paperback or on Kindle. Okay. Yeah. So people will be able to find you. Tom uh, And we'll make sure by the end of the show to announce that again. My, so I, I, I'm what I'm getting at here is... You're in, uh, you're in uh, Saudi Arabia. You are, are you beginning, are you sort of writing, are, are you writing the daily uh, uh, images and things that you want and it, it starts to come together? I mean, did you know from the moment you started that you were going to write a book or were you just writing short stories? Uh, I was, I was doing both. I mean, I think I've, okay. done, I've done both. And then... Uh, well, I know you've written short stories. I'm aware of that. But yeah. I was wondering where you went in that... First sure. writing shot, what, what, it was sort of a daily exercise that became a habit, a way to keep you. For the dream mechanic, uh, I knew that uh, I would put it together as a novel uh, because one of my favorite books was a thing by uh, Sherwood Anderson called Winesburg, Ohio. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. No. Uh, it's, it's a sort of a series of interlocking stories mm-hmm. uh, and so I sort of had that in my mind when I wrote it uh, but I, I knew that I would I had enough to put together a, as a as a book mm-hmm. as okay. a novel yeah but I would uh, I would I had some of those individual chapters they stand alone and I had them published online in different magazines mm-hmm. online. Interesting. Reader's right. Digest comes to mind. This sounds like it would be something uh, fit for, for, you know, the smaller publications that will give you verses and chapters of books. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, if you l- look, there's, uh, I had probably f- of five or six of the individual chapters that were published uh, mm-hmm. on- online. Mm-hmm. How does writing uh, evolve into poetry? So... When I was going to USF, uh, I, I, you know, I wrote a few things, and um, uh, uh, the, one of the professors liked it, and he was going to put it in a book. I don't think he ever did, but I mean, so I, had, I sort of had the bug. But then, like, you know, I graduated, so I was like, you can't make a living writing yeah, I can't feed myself. I can't buy a new car writing poetry. So, I mean, I had a bunch of stuff that I'd written, and my wife... I was one day I said, "Man, I'm throwing this crap out." And she said, "Don't throw it out." <laughs> so I still have it. Nice words. Yeah. So, 
um, you know, in the last 10 years or so, 10, 15 years, I just, I, I would write stuff, po and that's, I would save it as a, po as a, as a poem. And uh, so that's, that's how I got back into it. Yeah, well, poetry sort of is a way of getting an essence out. Yeah. And when you're writing a story, even a short story, even a two-page story, a one-page story, right. you're you're sort of aware that it's a narrative that has a beginning it's and a an end. And it is. It. Right. But whereas a poem can be this sort of... It's an explosion. It's an yeah. explosion. Yeah. Exactly. And, sentiment. Uh, sentiment. And, and uh, so a lot of my stuff, it's, um, you know, it's sort of Emily Dickinson, uh, you know, short, mm -hmm. but uh, poignant. You know, mm -hmm. and, you, and you have a, you have how many books now published altogether? I have seven books. That's pretty good, Tom. Seven, yeah. That's pretty good. And Did you buy you that big about... house on the hill? I'm just wondering. <laughs> What's up? Did you buy that big house on the hill yet? No, I have. Okay, a, no, no, a, I have a house. If Noah's in, a... I have a house in Palmasia. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> on the golf course, he is. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm what you call a Palmasia paper millionaire. Nice. <laughs> did you did you do much writing? You you mentioned it a little bit. Did you write much in a non online periodicals? Did you do much of that? I did not. No, no okay. website for Tom Fillion. No website. I have a blog, but I don't. I'm, don't attend to it too much these days. Not really. No. Okay. No, 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 okay. We're just no. we're just trying to figure out where you're at presently no. in your in your development as an author, right? Uh, Are you still active? Are you still trying to hammer out some new oh, no, material? No. Oh yeah, yeah. I have two two novels that I have. I'm just I have not published them yet. And uh, then I've been doing a thing um, uh, that I call Bayshore Chronicles. Oh, that sounds fun. Because I go down on Bayshore on, on my bicycle and. I just, somebody's you know, got to have to, somebody's gotta talk about the colonnade. Come on now. Oh, I know, man. It's gone. I know. Uh, Don't tell me. So, I mean, I have like 350,000 words that I've written on Bayshore Chronicles. But I don't, I, you know, it's Turn like, it into a screenplay, Tommy. Turn it into a screenplay. <clears throat> let us find a film crew, huh. write a little short, and let's enter something in the Gasparilla <laughs> Independent Film Festival. Let's talk off air and let's figure something out. I'll round up the camera crew. I'll get the actors. You give us the words. There we go. And it doesn't sure. have to be anything too big. We just something that's artistic and short. And this is this has become a high level meeting. So yeah, I love it. It's sort, it. Of, I love it's it. sort of a diary type thing, but it's like sure. how I mean th that whole area where I'm at has changed so much Dr dramatically. Mm -hmm. And uh, the balustrade's there, but much else beyond that. And Kojaks, know, come on now. I was down there the day that uh, you know that lady and her baby were. Oh. I was down there that day because I had just come back <clears> from. <throat> horrible. I know the graduation mm -hmm. that we had at Robinson, and I had come down there, and yeah, it was bad. But th there's something always going on on Bayshore. Well, you know, uh, 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 once writing has become a part of you, you can write about it. The rain falling outside. No. It doesn't have to really be. But Bayshore, I can see. I used to ride Bayshore many years ago when I was much younger on a on a regular, a daily basis. Right. And there's a lot of experiences out there. And by the way, I don't know if you've ever done this, but to ride the Bayshore and then pop over onto the island on Davis Island. I have done that. And ride all the way out to Peter O'Night and back. Yeah, That's done. an amazing experience. No doubt about yeah, it. Yeah. I've done that a few times. I usually... I'll do it on a Sunday when there's not much traffic. Right, sure. right. That's the best time to do it. The right. traffic anymore is abhorrent. We, we, uh, I, I hammer that nail every week. I try to, uh, when I go out there, I try to go before noon because people in cars seem to be a little more forgiving. I wear a reflective vest. I have lights blinking in the front, blinking in the back. And That's people... It. They're still on their phones. Driving. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you have to you have attention. to be extremely careful. Yeah. Well, we live in the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous areas in the country. Even though we have bike lanes everywhere, yeah. we really do. Um, now, now the, the latest phenomenon. Let me interject this real quickly, Tom, and I want your opinion on this. Sure. What is it with these e-scooters, my man? And what is it about these people that are on e-scooters that give them... Oh, it's a, in my the, Bayshore Chronicles. Why? Yeah. <laughs> why there it is. They, why are they riding in the middle of the lane at 25, 30 miles no, an hour? No, they're riding on the sidewalk there. Oh... Uh, yeah. Oh, I got some. You know what I mean about, about that e-scooter oh, yeah. phenomenon. Tom's what? already beat you to it. <laughs> <laughs> I figured. You By the way, you asked about him writing. Currently, I can already tell you that he's going to write until he can't write anymore. <laughs>
Uh, There's no doubt. I think that it's a part of that's he's it, not going to stop the expression writing. of who he is as a, as an so, individual. Oh yeah, there's correct few, us if we're wrong, Tom. No, no, no. There's a few. I have some buddies out there, and we're always, you know, just ragging on those guys on the uh, uh, on the on e-scooters. The, uh, on the e-scooters, yeah, because they'll come up behind you, and the, uh, you, you don't hear them. You can't hear them or see them, and they just go whizzing by you. Yeah. And uh, a little disconcerting. Like I tell my friend Marty, I said, look, if. If one of them hits me, he's got to make sure I don't get up because he's going in. The, he's going in the bay, and so with is that his e-scooter. E- with that e-scooter, they're both. No, it, it, they're going in the bay. To me, to me, if you just, for example, as you're whizzing along at 25, 30 miles an hour, precariously perched on this razor, you know, five inch, six inch wide platform, uh, and you hit a rock or you hit something that's in the, you know, I don't know how you maintain your balance. And at that speed, these guys aren't wearing it, and gals. Gals well, do it too. They're not wearing any protective gear. That's that's an accident waiting to happen. Even the uh, the the people on uh, uh, the rollerblades, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's especially on the Bayshore sidewalk because you know you have some lip some lips yes. and separation. I've seen uh, this one lady. Poor thing. I mean. She was coming towards me, and uh, she lost a wheel, and she went down like a ton of bricks. And uh, she, I, had, I had I had to call nine one one. She was bleeding. That oh, bad. that's terrible. The widest, uh, the, the longest contiguous sidewalk I think in the United States. It's, it's bragged upon as being that. Yeah. Uh, it's also rather generous in its width. Width. W i d t h. I can't say it because. My invisible so, lines. But I will say this about that sidewalk. It's unforgiving. <laughs> so, pal, if you bounce off of that sidewalk, good luck. I know. Uh, Better have your bean bucket on. But see, I say uh, that WMNF and Ybor City are crown jewels of Tampa. Amen. Let's say that again. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And the people that are listening here, I know Sean Canan can hear that. The people that are listening here uh, mm-hmm. agree with you wholeheartedly. And, you know, this is the little community radio station that still does. It could. It's like the little train, and, and we're still doing it. And by the way, since Tom brought Volunteers, it up. Volunteers, all of us. Since br- Tom brought it up, this is a good time to say that we are always open to receiving donations from you in the community. Oh boy. And tomorrow is Thanksgiving. Let's spread a little thanks to the conversation. If you're listening and you'd like to uh, drop a little uh, tip in our jar for the conversation, we'd deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for always reminding me of that, Joe, because I, we get so involved sometimes in our conversations with our guests and their... And listen, this has been one of the most fascinating. Tom, I mean, we're just getting to kind of know each other, right? I mean, I, I know you went but, to school with my brother and, know, yeah. and, and played ball against my brother. So, you know, you're Did closer you know, to his uh, age. Did you know Frank Cacciatore? Uh, Poopy, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And his dad and his yeah. mom. I mean, yeah, they, right. You know, Tampa's not that big, remember. Big little but, city. But Frank, but Frank, uh, both his parents and, and, of course, Poopy, you know, great, great people. You know, I saw him at our uh, uh, the last reunion that I went to at the uh, Hyatt on the uh, on on the bay, yeah. and, and that's what we, I think. That's what it's one of the hallmarks of our city. It's what we're losing each and every day, and it's what we fight so hard to kind of maintain. And I don't know if anywhere else in the country you can say this about cities. You know, you think of great cities in in, in the United States, the Chicago's, the Dallas's. They might be too big to feel this kind of sense of intimacy about your friends and the people that you grew up with three and four generations deep now, five sure. generations deep yeah. now. Yeah. So we're trying desperately to hold on to all of that. Tommy, we got about... Well, let's let's, let's talk a little bit left. more about these other books. Let's, let's yeah, get that's back. what I was going to say. Yeah. We, we don't want to leave anything out yeah, let's, in the time uh, remaining. Um, tell us a little bit about... Uh, what was your most recent book? What uh, is your last book? The most recent one that I published was uh, about Saudi Arabia. About your experiences there? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Hubbly Bubbly. Hubbly Bubbly. Hubbly Bubbly. And what, 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 what a catchy title. What, what'd you, uh, so how Hubble, did you come up with that? So Hubbly Bubbly, yeah. uh, the, um, the, guy, the uh, Saudi Air Force guys that I taught, uh, they would always invite me to, to go out and smoke Hubbly Bubbly. Dale. We don't know what that is, but it must have been a good time. Well, it's yeah. a hookah, correct? Yeah, it's a hookah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. It's bubbly, bubbly. Yeah. And, uh, bubbly because it's in the water and it's bubbly, right, making yeah. the bubbles. Bubbly, right. bubbly. No, there's no telling what they put in it, though. <laughs> so, d- does, uh, have you, uh, do you typically in your books, since I've not had the, uh, the honor, uh, to, to, uh, and the joy to read them all yet, do you typically have a sort of a, uh, protagonist who uh, runs through a character that runs through the, or is it a lot of s- vignettes? How does that work? 
No, there's definitely a, a protagonist, and uh, but a lot of different um, sub characters, I guess you'd call them. Uh huh. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you dabbled into any screenplay writing at all, Tom? I because have, I have you, not. we can get you the program for that, and you can sit at your little computer and you can do that all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds to me like you've got at least three or four screenplays locked up in that brain of yours. Yeah, I have not done. Well, that. let's get that out. Okay, <laughs> let's get that out because we need somebody. Watch me now, and I'm being sincere when I say this. We need somebody that can do that, especially about Tampa. Mm. There's not enough out there about our beautiful fair city and its history. There are things, a little, you know, few things, right. but something that's Tampa-centric that we can hone down and, and then put it on film so we can save it for posterity. Right. So what is your number one, uh, nah, I don't want to say number one, what, what experience having become an author, uh, a published author in which people recognize you as such, do you have one experience that's come out of all that that um, where you were honored somewhere or where somebody yeah. read your book. Tell us about or... your awards. Come on now. Well, I, I, I have not really promoted myself. That's In true Tampa fashion. And so I'm retired now, and um, this is like my second childhood. Okay. Have you heard the expression, once a man, twice a child? I love it. I'm going to start using it. Let me write that down. <laughs> uh, that's actually a... a, a this Cha could be ours, Joe, by the way. Yeah, this could right. be it's ours, a, There's yeah. a chapter in The Dream Mechanic, Once a Man, Twice a Child. So, I love it. So but now that I'm retired, I mean, I'm spending more time promoting my stuff. I just have never... I've done the writing. So as a teacher, so I taught high school. I had to be there like at 7.30 in the morning. Of course. I did my writing before I went to school. So you're getting up at 4. I got... Yes. You're getting up wow. at 4. You're putting in an hour and a half at least hard I, time. I would do a, I, I'd do a page. Okay. I would right. say, Yeah, I'd do a page. And... Uh, Again, the, discipline, because Tommy's disciplined. Page, I, get up, make the coffee. Well, and I'm, I'm here... Here I was here on time too. Yes, you were. Yes. No, we were in the car. <laughs> Sally and I were in the car, and you we came walking well, right by us. Yeah. If you're a teacher, man, you li you're you live time. you live and die by that bells. Bell. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so <laughs> I'm in my second childhood. I get up when I feel like there it. There you go. <laughs> and doesn't yeah. that feel grand? Oh, uh, tell me about Isn't it. That the best? <laughs> so uh, I don't like to start anything. Really, but do you have do you have a current writing discipline? Do you uh, uh, or a schedule? I do. I write in the morning. Yeah. You write every morning still. I still. Yeah. Yeah. Because what I've and noted I over the, to, I try to, I try to do something physical every day. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, one of the things that I've done for the last uh, maybe two years on Thursdays and Fridays, I volunteer at the Faith Cafe. I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar. Where is that located? Uh, it's in Midtown, up against the interstate. So they is it right there in the Midtown complex? Uh, it's on Dale Mabry and, you, can't, and you cannot see it. Okay. If you go Himes to Arch, which is right before the light, sure. take a right. Now Tico has put in a high rise. Tico is moving there, I believe. Okay. So, but uh, Faith Cafe is up against. Uh, you can't see it from the road, but they serve. Uh, food to homeless. Oh, that's wonderful. So I've been doing that for, I'd say, a year and a half, to, uh, two years. You're, you're listen. We're, we're just a, we're up against the heart out here in a couple of minutes, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm happy. So, and so I, I mean, and so I feel very thankful in my life at this point to be able to do that for these people. That's and wonderful, it, Tom. It's done by five or six churches in South Tampa. That's wonderful, and thankful is a theme that we I wanted to make sure we touched on before we left here today because tomorrow is a holiday that has all kinds of different meanings to different people. It's an official national holiday. Banks are closed and the world just kind of shuts down. And uh, we can talk about uh, the pilgrims and the uh, and indigenous Americans. peoples that were with them. But the real truth is I think of Thanksgiving as a time to really get your head straight on about gratitude. Gratitude in your life for everything that you have. And grateful I am today for having had Tom Fillion on our show. Tom, will you come back and do another show with us? Will you come back and flesh out this conversation a little bit more? No, I think we've got more to talk about. Oh, no, no. Oh, yeah. And, and, yeah. and people, people haven't been calling in today because they've been listening. This is what we experience here well, on the conversation. Well, we haven't gotten into the, uh, the old Tampa Mafia stuff. And we will. And with that, my dear friends, let's just say that Tom is just scratching the surface. We're going to have him back again. 
we're grateful, Tom, for your thank you, Tom. Today thank on the conversation. you. It's been we'd, wonderful. We'd like to say to everybody out there that's uh, that's listening to us, thank you for being there. If you'd like to join us at any point in time and show a little love in that tip jar, we would graciously accept that. That's uh, right. And by the way, stay tuned for Jim Bannon, who's going to be running the tunes. He's coming right up. He's coming right up in just a minute. So on behalf of everybody that works so hard to put this little show together each and every week with love in their heart to, to, to educate you, inform you, and maybe somehow entertain you as well. Thank you to Jessica Green, our OG, for working the boards. Thank you, my man. You I appreciate it. you, Joe. Always, always my I'm pleasure. I'm Mario Nunez, and you're listening to WMNF Tampa. Thank you.